Uh, hello, so my name is um, Sylvain Mino, and I'm here to talk uh, to you about uh, GSM and how you can attack it uh, with very cheap hardware. So I'll start with a short introduction about uh, GSM so you can understand uh, what I'm talking about, then uh, directly to the um, IMSI detached denial of service, and um, then how you can implement a passive listener um, with a simple mobile phone. So um, a few words about me. Uh, I have a background in computer science, and um, I'm generally interested in everything low level, and I've been working uh, with GSM for about two years, but more specifically the last year where, where I've been active in um, OpenBSC and um, Osmocom BB. So this is what a GSM network looks like, at least a plain 2G network, uh, voice only. So on the left, you have the mobile station, uh, basically the cell phone that communicates over the air um, to what's called the BTS, which is the base transceiver station. This is really just the transceiver. It doesn't have much uh, um, logic into it. And then um, BSC, base station controller, controls several BTS um, grouped into what's called a, a location area. It's, it's just uh, several BTS grouped uh, together. And then the, the MSC controls several BSC. And the elements that uh, we are interested in here is um, for the denial of service, the, um, we will inject packets onto the air interface and the, they will go transparently up to the MSC. The, um, the BTS and BSC will just uh, transfer them without interacting. And um, of course, um, to uh, sniff phones in the vicinity, will just uh, listen to the air interface. So this is what the GSM protocol uh, stack looks like. So at uh, layer one, you have uh, the, what's called the physical layer, then uh, the data link layer, which is called LAPDM, but we won't talk about uh, this here. And then finally, um, the highest level is uh, layer three, which implements um, all the various uh, control. So uh, on the air interface, um, it's split in several bands, as you probably know, like GSM 900 and DCS and PCS, things like that. And each of those bands has uh, two sub-bands, I would say. One is reserved for downlink, that is all information going from the network to the mobile station, and then uh, another sub-band for uplink, um, everything sent by the phone to the network. And, um, uh, what, what's called an ARFCN is basically uh, a pair of frequency, uh, one in the uplink and one on the downlink. Uh, okay, uh, on those frequency, the, 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 uh, the information is transmitted uh, by bursts. And uh, there are four main types of bursts, but um, three of them are really for special functions and only the, what's called the normal burst, transmit real um, data and information, and this is what this is what we want. Uh, those bursts are, are not transmitted, um, are transmitted synchronously, com completely. It's a, it's a full TDMA system, and uh, so some people described it as a nightmare because you have like TDMA inside TDMA, it's, it's very complicated. But for our purposes, what we need to know is that one frame is eight time slots, and each time slot is a burst. Um, and what's called a physical channel is one time slot on one particular RFCN, so on, on one particular uh, pair of frequency. Uh, up to layer three now, uh, we'll skip layer two. Um, it's subdivided again, and uh, the lowest layer, which is called the radio resource management, um, RR, um, basically establishes point-to-point -point connections, and what we really want to know is like um, the upper layer, which is called MM um, for mobility management. Um, this is what we will exploit in the, in the MC detached trick, and its main function is basically to track the user. It tries to answer one simple question, which is, okay, uh, I want to contact this user, uh, what location area is that user in? Um, it also ensures like, user uh, confidentiality, things like that. But um, uh, to accomplish this goal, it uses two main procedures. What's called the location update. Um, it, uh, this procedure is used in three separate cases. First, when you turn on, turn on your mobile phone, like you log in into the network, or when you change location area, so you basically um, tell the network, okay, I moved from uh, this location area to that other location area, or um, what's called the periodic update, basically without any, uh, without any reason, I'd say you, your, network, your phone will just contact the BTS to say, okay, I'm still here. 
Um, the other procedure is IMSI detach, and that's the, basically the log off of the network, saying to the network, okay, I'm turning off my phone. Um, don't try to contact me anymore. Okay, so uh, the denial of service itself. Almost all procedures in the network are, um, will be authenticated and ciphered, in a, in a real network at least. Um, the example on the left is the location update, for example, and you see the first step here is like the establishment of a point-to-point -point connection, then you, the phone requests a location update, and then the network authenticates, starts ciphering, and then proceeds into uh, effectively doing the location update Then the channel is raised. The problem with SIMSI Detach is that the, the specification doesn't allow for ciphering or authentication uh, at this stage. So you just open a channel, you say, okay, log me off the network, uh, here is my, uh, my identity, and you're automatically logged off without any kind of verifications. And of course, that's kind of a problem. So how do you exploit it? Well, it's pretty easy, you just open a channel, send uh, an IMSI detached indication message with the, um, the IMSI, which is the, um, like the, serial, the, the serial number of the, the subscriber, um, that you want to log off the network. And a year ago, that would have been pretty hard to do, but with Osmo Com BB now, um, we can just take the, the layer one and uh, implement, implement it on, on a simple mobile phone and, and send the message. It, it's really, really easy to do. Um, I implemented it in like 15 minutes uh, yesterday. It, it works just great. So what does it do exactly in the, in the network? So the MC touch indication will be sent up to the MSC, and the MSC will mark uh, that subscriber um, as detached. Uh, what this means is for mobile terminated services, that is if you're trying, if, uh, if you're trying to call the target, um, you will get a, a message like, okay, uh, this user is outside of the coverage area or something like that, because for, for the network, this user isn't connected. Um, for the user itself, if he tries to place a call, it will work because um, he will send a message, okay, I want to, to call that number, and the network will respond, okay, but you're not logged in, so please log in first, and it will then re-log in, and, and the call will proceed. It will just um, take a while longer because you have to do uh, much more work. Um, the spec says that, in theory, the MSC should, um, okay, should uh, terminate all MM connections. That is, if a, current, a connection is currently active, it should uh, shut it down immediately. This seems to depend on the network. Um, on my home network, uh, like in Belgium, it, that's what it does. If I send an MZ attached while I'm in a call, uh, the connection is like uh, cut instantly. Here on T-Mobile, it just does nothing. So apparently, this depends on the network. Um, an interesting side effect of the fact that uh, you create a, you force a new location update request is that it can help you uncover the, the relation between the MZ and the TMZ. So basically, when you log into the network, the to try to hide your identity, the network gives you a, a temporary uh, ID, which is only valid in, in that particular location area, and that's that's what's supposed to ensure confidentiality. But since you can force to uh, the renegotiation, you can actually uncover the, the relation between the two. And also, since you create more control traffic, that's that's good because, um, at least, well, good for an attacker, um, because control traffic means lots of known plain text, which is great if you want to, to break the ciphering key. And the ciphering key will probably be the same um, for the subsequent voice call, so you don't even have to crack it again. Um, the operator can actually defend pretty easily against that, because IMSI detach is an optional procedure. What I mean optional is that the network can use it or not. Uh, so since it's optional, just don't use it. Of course, um, you have to make sure that if you don't use it, you actually ignore all incoming IMSI detached indication, otherwise it's, it's just useless. Um, it's not free, because basically, if a user logs off, you don't know um, that he's not on the network, so you will try to contact him for nothing. Um, to try to track the user, you can like use the, the periodic uh, location update, that is, you force the phone to periodically ping the network, um, but this comes as a cost as well. 
since you will, the phone will use some, some control channel for, for some time. So it's basically a trade-off between uh, useless paging traffic and um, almost useless location updating request traffic. So that, that, uh, that's a show you can do. And also, and also, sorry, something else you can do is um, just refuse incoming uh, MZ attach um, where the identity is specified by MZ. So in, in the MZ det detach indication message, you can either detach a specific MZ or a specific TIMZ. So the, either with the, like the, the identity, the, uh, the global identity of the subscriber or, the, or its temporary identity. Since he is logged in onto the network, he has a TIMZ. So you should only accept uh, incoming uh, MZ attach when they are specified by TIMZ. And all phones I've seen uses the TIMZ. Only an attacker would use the TIMZ. Um, it's not a solution, but at least it, it can also make the targeted part a little harder. So what exactly does it do? So I'm going to get out of this. Um, actually, if, oh, sorry. I have actually um, a BTS here. So I have a, like a, a test GSM network running where I have connected several phones. So if I power on this phones, this phone, if he, OK, he powers on. OK, you see that he registered on the, on the network. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's him. OK, so if I try to call him right now, it should work just fine, hopefully. And it does. So that's kind of the expected behavior. Now I'm going to use uh, an attacker phone here to transmit an, an MZ detached message that, that will uh, log off this phone from the network. So for this, I just start uh, this. So here I'm loading the firmware, a modified firmware on this phone. Okay. Loading the firmware. And here I'm going to actually transmit the packet that's going to detach the phone. Okay, and it's been sent. So as, as you can see, the BTS, um, sorry, I'm pointing at my screen, but um, here has received an MZ detach. And if I try to call uh, this phone again, it should just not work. And it doesn't call failed because Officially, for the network, that phone is no longer on the network. So, I'm turning it off now. Uh, how do you turn that thing off? Okay. Okay. So now um, we're going to talk about how you can use the same hardware, so, so still this mobile phone, um, to use as a passive listener. So first, what do I mean by passive listener? What do I want? Um, I want the robust data. That is, um, as you saw in the beginning, there were four types of bursts. I want the normal burst, and I want those bits exactly and uh, not pre-processed or anything. Because if you want to crack A5 or do um, other things, you really need th that raw data. Preferably, I'd like uplink and downlink, because, uh, well, it's better. And um, frequency upping support, of course, because th this is really used on, on, on real networks. So you definitely want support for it. The target hardware is basically what Osmocom BB supports. Um, this is, uh, here I'm using a Motorola C1, C123, but uh, there are a lot of other models. Um, they were chosen because it's a, it's a classic TI Calypso design. That means that first there was leaked documentation, so we're not completely blind. And um, there are a lot of phones available for it, and they're all very cheap, like uh, 20 euro new, and you can find uh, them for like one euro if, if you can wait. Uh, why would we want to do that? Well, uh, de debugging GSM project, like if, if you're implementing um, 
things like uh, BTS or, or, or uh, Osmocom BB trying to implement new features, uh, it's always really useful to know what's exactly on the air. Because you can buy test equipment that does that, but this is very expensive, and being able to do it uh, for like 20 euro would be um, really nice. It's basically a, uh, a cheap USOP. It's kind of different, but um, the idea is the same. It has some advantage. Of course, it's much cheaper because the USOP is like 700 euro plus shipping and, and stuff. Um, it would have hopping and uplink support, which AirProbe doesn't support uh, what's published right now. Um, also, it's much more portable. I mean, I have this always in my bag. I don't have my USOP all, all the time uh, with me. Of course, it's, it's kind of limited because um, the, the USOP is basically a wideband um, software-defined transceiver. It can do much more than, than what the phone does, but the problem is it's also much harder to code because you basically have to code everything yourself. Um, for example, what's currently coded in AirProbe, uh, in particular the, the demodulator, it works, but it doesn't work as well as like the commercial demodulator that you would find in, in this phone that has been optimized for many years and it works very well. Uh, so in general, everything related to to GSM uh, could use, you know, a cheap sniffer. So this is what the the reception pass of a uh, of this phone looks like. It's of course a, a little simplified, but that's the idea. Each element, um, we're going to go through each element and see can this element uh, do what I want it to do? Is it an obstacle? And uh, if it's an obstacle, is there some way to walk around it or or, or, uh, or change it or whatever? Okay, the first element is, well, the antenna. It's uh, completely unremarkable. Uh, it's, it's like a zero dB gain. It's, it's, it's okay, it has poor gain. So it's okay if you want to receive the base station because the base station transmits with a lot of power. It's, it's also, um, you know, uh, placed very high above the ground. It has great antenna, so receiving it is really not a problem. On the other hand, if you're trying to receive the phones themselves, uh, they also have poor antenna. They, they only transmit like one watt maximum. Um, and that's only if the, the BTS doesn't tell him to transmit less power. And also they're, they're like at ground level, so receiving them is, is, is much harder. To try to, to walk around that, you can either use like an external antenna or uh, just pre-amplify the signal with a with a RF pre-amplifier. You you have to be careful though because um, if you amplif since your amplifier or your antenna will amplify everything, you can saturate the input stage of the phone and then you don't receive anything. Okay, the second element is the reception filter. Basically, to improve the the, the quality of the, the signal re received by the phones, the manufacturer put uh, filters in there that filters out everything that's not in the band that the phone is supposed to listen to, uh, which is great because it protects against uh, all kinds of interference. Um, however, it's bad for us because if we want to receive uplink, um, that signal is gonna be attenuated by something like 30, 40 dB. So you have an already weak signal, you're cutting 40 dB out of it, um, there is nothing left. Um, so, what can you do about that? Well, either you just don't care about uplink, um, that's an option, somewhat of an option. Um, you limit yourself to lab testing only, because in a lab, I mean, if you're holding one, the transceiver phone in one hand and the sniffer phone in another hand, it's gonna work fine. They're like one meter apart, the signal is gonna be strong enough. But uh, if you're like uh, 100 meters away, eh, that's not gonna work. So the only real option is to remove it. Um, it's kind of annoying because it's a hardware modification, but yeah, it's it's still better to do. Now, a couple of complications though. Um, the filter does more than just filter. It also converts what's called an unbalanced signal into a balanced signal. So basically it's a single ended to differential. So you can't just take the filter out and, and put a solder bridge in its place. You actually have to replace it by another component. Um, and those components are like, uh, two millimeters by one millimeter, uh, so, but you can do it. Um, and the other problem is a bias voltage difference. Basically, the, the input signal is like reference to the ground, and the output signal is reference to uh, some internal reference of the preamplifier. So you have to make sure you use uh, capacitors in the path, which again are like uh, 
O402, that's, that's, that's like very small. But it works. Um, just after that, you find the mixer. The mixer is basically the tuner of the phone. Um, it can obviously tune anywhere in any downlink band that the phone supports. So even if, actually even more than, than what the phone supports because the chipset itself supports like 850, 900, 1800 and 1900, even if officially it only supports like two, the, the tuner will actually um, support all the bands. But it obviously doesn't support tuning into the uplink because a real phone never has to do that. Um, that was kind of a problem. So we just tried it. We took the formula in the data sheet uh, how, to, how to compute the, the PLL configuration values and we applied them for the uplink frequencies and we loaded that and um, it just happened to work. Of course, it's outside of the spec so the, the characteristics might be a little, uh, um, a little less good but it works and that's the main point. So we just removed the check in the code that that checks if it's uh, inside the specification and just loaded the values. So the ARF mixer outputs um, analog IQ signals, quadratorial signals into the analog baseband. The analog baseband is just uh, basically an ADC. It converts the, the analog signal into digital samples that can be later processed. Um, it doesn't really pose a problem for us. The, the only problem currently is the driver for it is, um, is slightly limited because you configure, um, you configure it to receive like uh, 160 samples, that is one burst, and you have to, to configure it uh, for each uh, group of 160 samples. And currently the drivers that doesn't allow to um, configure two consecutive bursts. So that's a, that's a limitation. Uh, but that's a software limitation because the hardware has to be able to do it um, since it's a requirement for GPRS multi-slot and, uh, and this chip uh, is supposed to support at least two, two consecutive uh, bursts. So it, it, with a little work, we, we could just lift that restriction. Um, okay. Okay. The next step, the, the DS, the, inside the digital baseband, which is like the the biggest chip on the on the phone. Um, there is two subchips: the the DSP that will do all the demodulation and things like that, um, and the ARM. So the DSP is ROM based. That is, there is a firmware. It's um, hard written. We we cannot change it. What we can do, however, is is like apply small patches because the manufacturer didn't want to reburn a new chip each time. So there is a small area of RAM where you can um, overwrite small parts of the ROM in, in sort. They, they use like function tables and so you can overwrite uh, entries in, in the function tables if you want to call your function instead of the default function. Um, in theory, the DSP never gives you the raw burst. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the bits, the demodulated bits, it, it keeps them, and then it will apply like uh, uh, deciphering, uh, inverse error correction, uh, all convolutional coding, all that is applied inside the DSP, and what the, the DSP outputs is like a, a full layer two packet. Um, in case of control channel and for voice channel, it actually, um, decompress the voice data inside the DSP and sends them to, to the audio codec directly. Uh, so in theory, you're not supposed to, to get the raw burst. So you have to patch it. Um, procedure is, well, simple, uh, kind of. You just dump the ROM, which is in theory impossible. Uh, it's in theory copy protected, but you can walk around that. Uh, and finally, you reverse engineer it so you know how the ROM works. Um, hopefully, IDEA supports it. So after like uh, long hours staring at the assembly of uh, of the DSP, you can figure out how it works and uh, in the end write a custom task for the DSP that will do what what you want. That is, get the samples from the analog baseband, apply the demodulation, and then sends the the raw demodul demodulated bursts. Um, to the arm without any further processing. And um, this is something that took a long, long time, but it's finally done, so that's good. Then you have the, the arm processor. 
Um, Osmo Com BB has drivers for almost everything in the ARM uh, that we need, at least. It, it can drive the, AB, the analog baseband and, and, the, and the mixer and everything. Uh, it also has all the logic for cell selection, uh, cell uh, synchronization, and what's called the, sorry, the TDMA scheduler that is scheduling events at, at, on particular frames um, on the GSM network. There are a few things we need to change. Is um, first we need to patch the DSP uh, at the boot. It's, uh, that's kind of obvious. Um, finally, we need uh, we need a driver for the the new task that we added to the DSP. It's obviously not supported in the main line code, so we had to write a driver that allows to to program the DSP to use this new uh, command and and receive the raw burst. And finally, we never want to transmit anything, but instead if if we were, at, uh, if we wanted, instead of transmitting, sorry, uh, we want to receive, but instead of receiving on downlink frequency, we want to listen to the uplink frequencies. So, there are, the changes in the ARM code are actually pretty simple. Um, if you're familiar with the Osmocom BB uh, code, I would say. Um, yeah. Finally, we have to get the data out somehow. Um, Osmocom BB uses a serial port, uh, which is the advantage is it's very simple. However, uh, at 115 kilobaud, it's just not fast enough if you want to receive like um, two bidirectional voice channel. You have to receive like four bursts uh, of 160 bits, and we transmit soft bits and not hard decisions. So um, it's a lot of bandwidth. Not much of a problem. We can just increase the baud rate. The the only complication is that the uh, the standard cable that everyone uses is based around like the PL twenty uh, something uh, USB to serial controller, and that controller doesn't support non-standard baud rate. So we have to use um, the FTDI ones. Um, it's slightly less practical because it's it looks like that, but yeah. Uh, it's still very cheap, and the advantage is we get like four serial ports in, in one board, so we can control four phones at once if we wanted to. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So, Okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place a phone call from, um, like, uh, let's say, this phone to this phone, uh, and using the the sniffer phone, I'm gonna record the uplink and downlink of, of of this one. Of course, I will have both sides of the conversation since I'm listening to both uplink and downlink. Um, at once. So I'm loading my modified firmware inside the phone. What the sniffer application does is it listens to the, the assignment channel where the GSM tells, okay, uh, you go to that dedicated channel and switches to the first assignment it finds, listen to it and up until there is nothing left to listen to. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, here I'm talking into the call, the, the phone that's making the call, so I will hear this voice onto the uplink channel. If I'm talking onto the receiver phone, I should hear uh, what I'm saying in the downlink channel of this phone, since this phone is receiving it from the network. Oh, and it should sound. Okay. Okay, so what the sniffer application did is save the all the data inside a file uh, that contains all the bursts that have been recorded, and I'm going to take that and um, take it through a program that will uh, take the burst and extract the voice data from them. So if I look like, in theory, if I look like here, 
Okay, it created this file, which is 1428 uh, RFCN 876. Um, if I remember where the program is. Okay. Main Okay, so it processes the frame. Uh, for each burst, it displays what, what kind of data it found. Sometimes it finds nothing. Sometimes it finds control data or, or things like that. But for the voice data, it created, in theory, if I put it in full screen. Okay, yeah, it created those two files, speech DL and speech uh, uh, UL, which correspond to the speech channel for the uplink and the speech channel for the downlink, obviously. Uh, I can now play those. Uh, You'll notice that there was silence at the start because it actually transmits silence when um, I haven't actually answered the phone yet. Uh, yeah. I'm talking onto the receiver phone. I should hear uh, what I'm saying in the downlink channel of this phone since this one is receiving it from the network. So this was the, the downlink channel, and uh, as you said, you, you heard uh, uh, what I said. And uh, of course, the, the uplink channel is the same, but for the other channel. OK. Uh, going back to the slides. Okay, so um, very short summary. Uh, basically, GSM has, has definite protocol flows. That's, that's very clear. Um, the attacks are both very simple in, in principle and uh, very cheap to implement. So you can only imagine that if, if more people spend time you know, working on this, what they could possibly find uh, um, on this and, and know with the, the hardware that exists uh, and, the, and the software, sorry. sorry. It becomes very, very easy. Um, what kind of stuff um, could you do to in the future? Um, okay. One problem that it, that happens um, a lot if you if you try to to listen to a commercial network um, is that the phone doesn't directly go to the voice channel. It's is sent to a control channel, and then uh, the ciphering is enabled. And when the phone is actually answered, you get switched to a voice channel. Um, this has caused some problems if you want to actually listen to the, to the voice calls, because the, the assignment to the voice channels is transmitted uh, in ciphered, ciphered. So you'd have to crack it very, very fast if you want to follow, to follow it. Um, but instead of just um, Following the assignment uh, of the network, you can monitor the the transmission power that you that you detect on uh, on those frequencies, and you will see clear. Um, if the cell isn't too busy, you will see that you have RF power, and then it drops when the channel is cut, and then when it's uh, assigned, you see that it rises again, and that allows you to break like the uh, the hopping sequence and and stuff like that by just analyzing the RF power if the cell isn't too busy. One problem with this approach is uh, what's called uh, discontinuous transmission. Basically to save power both in your phone and in the network, when there is nothing to transmit, like uh, silence, um, it doesn't actually transmit anything. So you don't detect any, uh, any power at all. Hopefully there is always um, a control channel that, uh, that's associated and this one is always transmitted. So you can always monitor that. There is less data on it, so you have less data points to, to find uh, the assignment. But uh, I think it's, it should be possible. That's, uh, that's something to try. Um, something else we've started to uh, working on is using a phone as a BTS. Because um, if you want to experiment with uh, like the network, we now have Osmocom that can run on, on very cheap uh, phones. But if you want to fuzz like uh, your iPhone uh, from the network, you, you still have uh, a bit of investment because you have to either get a USAP to run like OpenBTS or uh, NanoBTS or, or BS11, but those uh, are hard to find now. Um, and they aren't cheap. I mean, a, a NanoBTS, like uh, it's on the floor here, it costs like $300,000. So, uh, 3000 sorry. 
Yeah. Uh, so if you could do it with a 20 euro phone, that, that, would, that would be great. And I think it's possible, at least using two phones. Um, that's definitely something you want to look into. And so some other people were talking about uh, using phone, direct phone to phone communication. Uh, that's also something you could probably easily do. And you know, whatever you can think of. If, if you find something that you, you think is interesting and uh, uh, please research it and, and, and read the spec and see if, if it's really possible and try to implement it, 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 it would be great. Um, a final thanks to basically everyone that um, contributes to OpenSource GSM projects. Um, and uh, the most no notable names, uh, of course, Harold Welt, uh, Dieter, uh, David Burgess, that works on uh, OpenBTS, Carsten Noll for the A5 project, and um, Olger, that works a lot on OpenBSC, and Andreas, who has like, almost single-handedly implemented uh, the mobile application on the upper layers of uh, Osmocom BB. Um, also thanks to the NLNet Foundation, who funded uh, part of, the, of this work. Um, here is some reference that you can read. Um, basically, the AirProbe project, if you want to use the USAP to listen to traffic, Osmocom, BB, um, for the software um, that runs on this phone. Also note that the, the sniffer code um, is in the Git now. It's a, it might not be the latest version, but I, I will push the latest version um, soon. Um, OpenBSC, OpenBTS, and, and finally, please uh, read the GSM spec if you're interested, because um, it's a it, yeah okay. It might be a little intimidating because there is like a lot a lot of specification, but you don't have to read them all. Uh, there are a few uh, a few pointers in in, in the beginning uh, of what specification you could read, depending on what you're in interested in. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Does anyone have uh, any question? Yes? Um, I have a question is to clarify the MC detached dose. Um, do you, can you actually send uh, the MC and not the TMC on, uh, from anywhere in the network, or do you really have to be in the location area? Or okay, uh, from what I've tested, it's on, uh, on the location area. But I only tested on like uh, four networks. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there are some bad implementations. Uh, the, the specification doesn't really um, say that you must check, but it seems obvious that you should. So. And um, did you did you try on all your the networks you tested uh, with the Team C and both both Team C and MC and do they? All uh, I tested MC? actually only tested with the with the IMZ because each time I didn't know my my Team Z. Okay. Uh, but I know that the phone sends the TMZ, so it should work with the TMZ as well. But I tested with the TMZ, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, did you try to make the same uh, exercise that the second one that you did with um, the voice which is encrypted with A51? And if you did it, how long it would have taken to get the voice when it's encrypted? Um, I, okay. Um, I, I dumped bursts that were encrypted. Uh, it was not. It wasn't voice, but it was. Uh, it was uh, control data. No, it's since you get basically the same the same data uh, out of this program as you get from AirProbe. Uh, the time to crack is exactly the same. So it will heavily depend on your on your machine. In general, it takes like you need eight bursts uh, of uh, of known plain text. Um, and it takes, at least on, on my setup, it takes like one minute by burst to, to break it. Okay, so the same, the same demonstration with the call which is encrypted with A51 would be decrypted in the same amount of time. You could have done the demonstration with the yeah, call. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, when you try to record just to be sure, uh, a fair one encrypted calls. Uh, if you try to break the key, you will just have the possibility to read the control channel and get the voice channel assignment after you break the key. So if the call is long enough, you will have uh, the possibility to jump channels, but otherwise you would lose um, at least one minute of 
you may lose uh, at least one minute of call, uh, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Exactly. Th that's that's a problem that you would face uh, if you're trying to listen to voice channel on the on the commercial right, uh, network right now. Is that you you don't know where to go. So that's why uh, trying to monitor the channel with the uh, RF power would be interesting. The other option is on small cells using like uh, several phones. You can actually continuously dump every voice channel, uh, and then afterwards, once you know where you, what you sh should have listened to, you can just how many take channels that. Are, are there? Uh, you have eight time slots. Okay, um, it, it depends a lot of the cell, but one frequency can host eight time slots, um, and uh, some cells have only one frequency. Others have like 33, so it, it gets a lot. And a, a phone can record um, four time slots per, per frame. Thanks. <laughs>